All right, guys, we're going to be in the uh, Pauline epistles again, and I want to begin by um, summarizing what we talked about last week and getting into some more detail about it. Um, there's 13 epistles, 14 if you count Hebrews, uh, written by the Apostle Paul, and there's so many details in it. Um, my my plan here is to give you a overview of what that section of the Bible is about so that you'll understand uh, why it's in your Bible and, and how to properly minister these things. And so here in Acts 26, 17 through 18, um, we have uh, Paul's own words about what Christ told him when he appeared to him and what he was being sent to do and who he was being sent to uh, the first thing notice in the in the verse is that christ was sending the apostle paul to the gentiles he says that he was going to deliver him from the people meaning israel and from the gentiles unto whom now i send thee and then he's told why he's being sent to the Gentiles is to open their eyes. Now, Paul prays for this in the book of Ephesians, the eyes that he prays that the Ephesians, the eyes of their understanding would be enlightened. And through this opening of the eyes, through opening their eyes, they're going to be turned from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God. And the purpose of sending him there to do this is that these Gentiles, there's a twofold purpose here, is that they might receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. And so there's a twofold purpose in Paul's ministry to the Gentiles. Uh, the first purpose is for them to receive forgiveness of sins that they might be saved and also that they might receive an inheritance. Now notice this, among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Now the word sanctified means to be set apart for God. It's, it's, it's uh, sanctification means that you, you've been set apart to fulfill a specific purpose for God. Uh, even furniture back in the Old Testament, uh, the furniture of the temple was was holy. It was sanctified. It was set apart to fulfill a specific purpose, uh, such as the altar. The altar was set apart by God to be a place for him to receive sacrifices and gifts for sin. And so as a uh, these Gentiles that receive forgiveness of sins, are set apart by God uh, for to receive an inheritance, and that inheritance is for a sanctified people, a people that's been set apart to fulfill a holy purpose of God. And what sanctifies us is faith, by faith that is in me. But we got to understand faith is not just a one and done thing. Now that it is as it pertains to receiving forgiveness of sins, but the Bible says the just live by faith. And so when it comes to living unto God, uh, our whole Christian life is to be lived out by faith. Uh, uh, God's grace operates through faith. And so as we live by faith, we are receiving grace from God. And this, this grace that we receive through faith sanctifies us. And so sanctification uh, is a positional thing. Look in, look in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, or 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 2 says, Unto the church of God which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus. And so 
right there we see that sanctification is a positional thing. Uh, nobody outside of Christ is sanctified. Uh, we have to be in Christ to be sanctified unto God. However, if you look at First or Second Timothy chapter two, Second Timothy chapter two, Paul says, uh, verse number twenty. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. And so you got to understand sanctification is a positional thing, but it's also once we're in Christ, as we purge ourselves from all errors and from all sin and things like, like that, as the word of God washes us as as paul said in ephesians that christ gave himself that he might sanctify and cleanse us by the washing of water by the word and so the more we grow up in the word of god and the more that we receive the word of god the more we're being sanctified uh, for god's use and for god's purpose and so i just want you to understand that that the inheritance that we've that we've been set apart to receive is so that we can fulfill a holy purpose of God. And this is what Paul talks about in second Timothy chapter two or chapter one, uh, verse number nine, where he says that God had saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works. And so your works, your works, cannot god did not give us this holy calling according to our works he gave us this holy calling according to his own purpose and grace and so it's his grace that brings us into this holy calling prepares us for this holy calling sanctifies us for this holy calling for us to fulfill the purpose that he gave us in christ before the world began and so before the world ever began God had already purposed in himself that he was going to create this church and that all who believe the gospel would receive forgiveness of sins and be brought into this church to receive an inheritance to fulfill a purpose that he gave us in Christ before the world began. And he's, he's given us this through his grace and he's preparing us through this, for this by his grace. And so what you're receiving in Paul's epistles is grace from God that, that gives you forgiveness of sins. It teaches you about this calling that God has given us. And that grace also builds you up and edifies you uh, for that inheritance. Uh, Acts 20 and 32, I didn't put this verse on the slideshow, but if you look in Acts 20, 32, we talked about this verse last week. And I want you to understand this. Acts 20 and 32, the apostle Paul says, and now brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. And so the, we see there that the inheritance, every person in the body of Christ is going to get an inheritance. But the inheritance that you receive uh, from God is going to be in accordance to how you're built up by, his, by the word of his grace. And so Paul's ministry is not just to save you and to give you forgiveness of sins. His ministry is to educate you about this inheritance and this calling of God, and then to build you up and to transform you by the renewing of your mind, that you may be a person that's truly furnished unto the good works that God has ordained for his church. And so, and so we are going to receive our inheritance based upon 
uh, or qualification through the doctrine of God. God's doctrine has been given to us to transform us into that new man that knows how to walk pleasing unto God. And that's how the inheritance is going to be determined. And so, and so Paul's ministry was also given to build us up uh, for that calling and for that inheritance. And so, and so just know that, that this calling that God gave us when he saved us and called us, we were a part of a calling to fulfill a purpose that God gave us in Christ before the world began. And so when you heard the gospel and believed it, um, the apostle Paul says in Ephesians 1, 13 through 14, he says, in whom you also trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Now, the gospel of your salvation is what Paul defined in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. The gospel of our salvation is how that Christ died for our sins and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day. Uh, Paul calls that the preaching of the cross in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Christ and him crucified, uh, which is the power of God unto salvation. And so Paul. Paul says that after we heard that and trusted in Christ, not only did we receive the forgiveness of sins, but he says also in Ephesians 1, 13, that in whom also after that ye believe, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance. And so after we heard that gospel and believed it, we were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise as the earnest or the guarantee of our inheritance, the down payment of our inheritance, so to speak. And so everybody that has trusted and believed the gospel has been sealed as, as, the, as the church of God. They've been sealed in Christ as a purchased possession. And that promise of God is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. And so what God was doing when you heard the gospel, God was calling you uh, into this holy calling that he's given us in Christ. And when we believe that gospel, we became a part of this church that God is now creating in Christ uh, to fulfill this calling and purpose that he gave us in Christ before the world began. And every one of us now has the earnest of our inheritance. Every one of us is going to receive a portion of this inheritance. And that, that will happen when Christ comes to redeem uh, the church that God purchased with his own blood. And so real quick, just a very simple, um, very simplistic view of this. Back here before the foundation of the world, all the way back here, we were chosen. Now, that doesn't mean God chose individuals. What, what he did was God determined that he was going to create this church in Christ. And so God chose to create this church, and he determined that all who believe the gospel was going to receive the forgiveness of sins and inheritance and so he chose us in christ before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame that we should be holy and without blame uh, this church is holy unto god it is something special to god and he chose us in that position before the foundation of the world and predestinated us to the adoption of children so what that means is when he chose us to the adoption of children, he chose us to become sons to receive an inheritance. And so because of that, right here at the cross, Jesus Christ shows up. He goes to the cross and, and, and sheds his own blood. He spills his own blood for the redemption of that church. 
Now, up to that point, it had been hidden God. Uh, Satan didn't know this, that when Christ was dying on the cross, that he was purchasing, he was shedding his blood to purchase a people uh, to fulfill this, this election and predestination of God before the foundation of the world. And so when Christ dies on the cross, he's dying to pay the price to redeem this church that it might fulfill this purpose that God gave us before the world began. And then after the cross, the apostle Paul was sent out by Jesus Christ to preach the gospel that the, that the Gentiles might be called and receive forgiveness of sins and be called and sealed in Christ as this church that has been to fulfill this this predestinated purpose God gave us in Christ. And so when we heard the gospel out here, we were called by God and sealed by that Holy Spirit of promise to this special purpose that God gave us before the world began. And when this church is complete, Christ is going to rapture this church. The redemption of the purchased possession is when Christ comes and claims uh, his people uh, that have believed the gospel. And then we go up here to receive our inheritance in the heavenly places. And so um, back to Second Timothy now, Paul, after he says this about that God had saved us and called us with a holy calling, he says, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but now is made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so God purposed this before the world began, but it wasn't made manifest until the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And then Paul says in the next verse, he says, whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles for the which cause I also suffer these things. <clears throat> and so Paul was appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles in accordance to this manifested purpose of God. And so understand that that's Paul's specific appointment um, by God. Uh, Paul was appointed by God, by the Lord Jesus Christ, according to this reveal this purpose that God gave us in Christ before the world began and is now made manifest. And so know that, understand that Jesus Christ shed blood for you, not just to keep you out of hell. He shed blood for you because God before the foundation of the world predestinated this church to adoption, to fulfill a purpose that he gave us in Christ before the world began. And then after Jesus Christ shed his blood, the apostle Paul says in Ephesians 1, 9 through 11, that God has made known unto us, get this now, made known unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself. Now in verse 10, he says, now here is the purpose of God. We're getting ready to read this, but we're going to talk about the mystery of this purpose. The purpose of God is that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. And so the purpose of God is the gathering of two things in Christ together in one. And then Paul says in verse 11, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. And so your inheritance, the inheritance that we have obtained is according to this purpose of God 
that Paul lays out in verse 10. We have obtained an, uh, an inheritance in accordance to what God has purposed for all things in heaven and earth. And so what, what Paul is saying is our calling is to receive an inheritance that God predestinated the church to receive before the foundation of the world to fulfill the mystery of his eternal purpose. And so the eternal purpose of God concerns the earth and the heavens being gathered together in one. Our inheritance is in heaven to fulfill the mystery part of that purpose. And so I hope that makes sense to you guys. This is what God has made known to us, not the entire, when Paul says that God's made known to us the mystery of his will, he's not saying that the will of God in the Old Testament was a mystery. God, God revealed in the Old Testament his purpose in the earth. What he's now made known is the mystery of his will concerning heaven and earth. And our inheritance, as Paul said in Ephesians 1, 3, our inheritance, God has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, according as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us to the adoption of children. And so God, God before the foundation of the world predestinated us to this inheritance and we've now been blessed in the heavenly places in Christ uh, to obtain this inheritance. And the reason God has given us this inheritance is to fulfill uh, this eternal purpose that he's purposed in himself concerning all things in heaven and earth. And so when we come to Colossians now, we're going to see what Paul is talking about, about all things in heaven and in earth. And so in Colossians 1, 6, 10, notice the phrase by him, because he's going to talk about by him also in Colossians 1, 20. But in Colossians 1, 16, it says, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions, principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And so the creation of all things and what he means there by all things is thrones, dominions, principalities or powers. This, these, 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 governments, these positions of authority, they were all created by Christ and for Christ. Now, since the creation of those things, those things are not being used for Christ. Iniquity has entered. Sin has entered. Uh, Satan has corrupted the creation through his iniquity <clears throat> and through Adam's disobedience, sin entered into the world. And so all those things that were created for Christ are not being used for Christ. They're being used for, for man and Satan's self-will and lawlessness. Uh, these things are not subject to Christ or to God. They're in disobedience. And so in Colossians 1.20, the one who created these things uh, Colossians, remember Colossians 1.16, by him were all things created. And then in Colossians 1.20, he says, and having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And so what he's talking about here is that Christ, when he shed his blood on, on the cross, the, per, the reason he was shedding his blood on his on the cross is for himself to reconcile all these things that were created for him back to himself. Now, right there, Colossians 1.20, reconcile all things unto himself. He's not talking about people yet. He's saying that Christ shed his blood 
for the purpose of reconciling all thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers to himself. Now, the reason, but the reason he shed his blood is to redeem people, to redeem us, and to sanctify us, to present us to himself one day. Right? Come back to Ephesians 5 real quick. I want to show you this because <clears throat> these things were created for Christ. And now he's reconciling all these things that were created for him back to himself. So in, in Ephesians uh, 5.25, Paul says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself. A glorious church, not having any spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that, that it should be holy and without blemish. And so we see there that Christ died for the church, redeemed it so that he could sanctify and cleanse it. Verse 27, that he might present it to himself. And so one of these days, Christ is going to present this church to himself and why is he presenting this church to himself he's going to present this church to himself and set this church in these thrones dominions principalities and powers for the purpose of reconciling those things unto himself and so he's going to remove all iniquity from heaven and earth and install in in his his own creation these people that have been been forgiven saved and sanctified for this purpose and so now we're starting to learn what our actual calling is why we've obtained an inheritance we've obtained an inheritance for the purpose of receiving uh, a position in in christ's government and to be a holy people so that those thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers will actually be used for him instead of against him. And so we're going to be set in those positions for the purpose of reconciling those things back to Jesus Christ. And when you understand that calling, guys, what type of people should we be? What holy people we should be? What righteous, godly people? We should be knowing that we've been called to reconcile uh, the government that was created for Christ back to him. We are created to be to to be used by Jesus Christ for the purpose of reconciliation. And so in the next verse, Paul now says, and you. And so here we see now that. Everything was created by Christ. He died on a cross to reconcile all those things to himself. And then in Colossians 1.20, this is where you come in. He says, and you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. And so now we see why we've been reconciled. We've been reconciled for the purpose of being presented one day. Uh, one second, guys. Hey, let me call you back. I'm on the Discord with the Philippine guys teaching this class. I'll call you back in about an hour. All right, bye. All right, sorry guys. Um, Colossians one or, or right here, we we are we've been reconciled to be presented one day, and so the reason that that we've been that we've been saved and reconciled to Jesus Christ is for a future presentation. One of these days, we are going to be presented. To Jesus Christ, he's going to present us to himself for this purpose of reconciliation. 
And so we are going to be presented to him, and then he's going to place us somewhere in uh, somewhere in that that government that's been created for him. He's going to he's going to give us a position in those thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers for the purpose of reconciling those things unto himself. But look in Colossians now, Colossians 1, 23, and I want you to see <clears throat> that, yes, we've been reconciled. Our reconciliation has passed. Paul says, now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death. We've already been reconciled. But this presentation, if you look at Colossians 1, 23, Paul says, if, that means there's a condition. And it, it, the, the condition there doesn't deal with your reconciliation. You've already been reconciled. The condition is about your presentation one day. And so Paul says that if we continue in the faith grounded and settled, and so our presentation being presented holy and blamable and unreprovable in his sight is conditional. We have to be sanctified and washed by the water of the word to be presented holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. And that's why Paul said, if you continue in the faith, if you continue in the faith, it doesn't just mean continuing in the faith doesn't just mean that 20 years after you believe, you still believe what you believed 20 years ago. Continuing in the faith, the, the faith is a progressive uh, doctrine. It, it is, as we go from Romans throughout Paul's epistles, we are being washed and edified and matured and transformed and grown by the word of God. Paul said, I've planted Apollos watered. God gave the increase. The purpose of the word of God is to increase you and to grow you and mature you to make you a fruitful man that is profitable unto God and profitable unto this calling that we have in Jesus Christ. And so when we talk about continuing in the faith, we're talking about like a kid, the way a child continues in school. He goes from kindergarten or whatever grade it is all the way up to graduation. Continuing in the faith means that we continue through the doctrine that God has given us. And if we continue in that faith grounded and settled, we will be we will be established and built up in Jesus Christ to be presented holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. This is why Paul says that God's grace, the word of his grace is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance. And so we are to continue in the faith. And so I want you to understand that how you're presented, your reconciliation and salvation is not conditional. You've already been reconciled. You're going to heaven at the rapture. Christ is going to call you out if you believe the gospel. But how you're presented in that day is conditioned upon how you continue in the faith and in the word of God. Right? And so I want you to just understand that about this presentation. We're going to be presented to receive an inheritance as a part of reconciling all these things that were created for Christ, we're going to be presented to receive that inheritance that we might reconcile those things back to Christ. And so we have to continue in the faith to be, to be edified and built up for that purpose so that we can be presented one day to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so this is why Paul says in Ephesians 4 that because of this inheritance that the church has been predestinated to, that Christ gave his church, right? This he gave he gave the church apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, 
And so the reason Christ gave the church these apostles and prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers is he gave those things to the church for the purpose of, of preparing this church for that calling uh, that we have when he comes and raptures the church. And so as we're down here waiting the rapture and waiting for Christ to come and get his church, there's a ministry that he has given to get his church ready. Uh, Christ is not going to wait till we get there to get us ready. Now we're going to get a new body. We know that. But he's doing a work of faith inwardly today. He is transforming us inwardly by his spirit. And so the, the inward man, as Paul said in 2 Corinthians, though the outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. And so the inward man is already being perfected uh, for this calling. And so uh, this is very important, guys, to understand, all right, are you a pastor? Are you a teacher? Are you an evangelist? An evangelist's job is to go out and preach the gospel to get people saved. A pastor and teacher's job is to teach the this doctrine to take those saved individuals and build them up uh, uh, for this calling and purpose of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and so there's a there's a threefold purpose there uh, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, and for the edifying of the body of Christ. And so this is why Paul says in Colossians 1.28, whom we preach warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom. And so I believe what he's saying here is that we preach Christ warning every man. That's that's the gospel. Uh, trying to get men saved. We preach Christ and warn every man to believe the gospel so that they can be saved. And we teach every man and we teach every man in all wisdom. Why? that we may present every man perfect in Christ. And so back up and back earlier in that chapter, Paul says that Christ uh, reconciled us to present us holy, unblameable, and unreprovable. And then Paul talks about if we continue in the faith. And then at the end of the chapter, he talks about how he as a minister uh, preaches and teaches for the purpose of presenting every man perfect in Jesus Christ one day. And so to summarize this, to summarize these things, when you heard the gospel and believed it, God saved you. That's your salvation. You received forgiveness of sins and you were reconciled. And when you were saved, you were now a part of this church that has a holy calling uh, that God gave us in Christ before the world began. And so you've been saved and called with a holy calling. The third part is the perfecting of the saint. All right. A saint is somebody that's been sanctified and set apart for God. He's holy to God. And so those that have been saved are called to be saints. You can find that Romans, uh, you can find that Corinthians, that we are called to be saints, called to be holy and sanctified unto God. And so once you were saved and a part of this holy calling, there's a ministry to perfect the saint, to, to build that saint up and to perfect him for this calling. Then there's going to come the presentation. Every one of us is going to be presented to Jesus Christ one day. And then we're going to receive our inheritance based upon our perfecting and our doctrinal edification and, and our qualification. Christ is not going to set unqualified people in a position. 
You have to be found qualified for what he gives you to do. And we need to understand that Paul meant what he said when he says that in this great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, some to honor and some to dishonor. When that day of presentation comes, there are going to be some people found, they're, they're going to be placed and it's going to be dishonored. There's going to be some found to honor. Uh, this is why Paul in Corinthians talks about gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. And so understand, guys, that salvation is just the beginning. You've been saved to fulfill a holy calling. God gave you his word to perfect you for that calling. And then you're going to be presented to Jesus Christ one day, and you're going to receive an inheritance based upon how Jesus Christ finds you. You're either going to be found as gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or stubble. And then he's going to place you in his inheritance for the purpose of reconciling all things unto himself. And so we come to first Timothy now after the nine church epistles, Paul writes some personal epistles, two to Timothy, one to Titus, one to Philemon. <clears throat> and so these epistles are written to mature men. These, these epistles, Timothy and Titus are not for babies in Christ. Therefore, mature men in which Paul is going to educate these men about how to be ministers of this doctrine. But before you can be a minister of the doctrine, you have to grow up in the doctrine yourself. And he tells Timothy now at the beginning of first Timothy, right after the church epistles, the first thing he says is he tells Timothy, as I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus. When I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Now, the doctrine that Paul's referring to, you see, guys, I just believe my King James Bible is perfect. And so there's no way you can understand what he means by no other doctrine unless you believe what you've, what's been written up to this point. Paul writes this, and it's in your Bible in 1 Timothy. That doctrine has been defined in Romans through 2 Thessalonians. That is the doctrine that God has given today to prepare his this church that he's creating. He's given that doctrine to, to get this church ready for their calling. And Paul's telling Timothy here to charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Now, that doesn't mean we don't teach the Old Testament or, or that we don't teach prophecy. But what, what we have to understand is our specific calling and election and the doctrine that God has given us to get us ready for our calling. And then we understand our calling and election and its fellowship uh, to the other parts of the Bible. But when he says teach no other doctrine, he's referring to the doctrine that he's laid out in those nine church epistles. And then he says, neither give he to fables and endless genealogies, watch this now, which minister questions rather than godly edifying which is in faith, so do. And so here we see the purpose of the doctrine. The doctrine in those church epistles was given to minister godly edification in faith. And so the doctrine, when that doctrine is preached correctly and it's taught correctly and it's believed by those who, who's, be, who's hearing it, Right. If it's if we teach it correctly and the person that we're teaching doesn't believe it, it's not going to work any. 
if we don't teach it correctly, it's not going to work. But if we teach the doctrine correctly and it's believed by those who we're ministering to, it's going to produce godly edification. This is what Paul meant in 1 Thessalonians 2.13 when he says, when you received uh, the word of God, which he heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which worketh effectually also in you that believe. And so he's saying, when we taught the word of God and you received it and believed it, it worked effectually in you. It produced something. And what it's producing is godly edifying. And that godly edifying is to, is to transform us into a godly people, redeeming us from all iniquity, transforming us into godly people that are zealous of good works that we've been ordained to. And so we see there that the work of the ministry, remember when Paul says that pastors and teachers and these things were given for the perfecting of the saint, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, the work of the ministry is to minister godly edification in faith. And so I got this up here, godly edification. On the, on the left here, you have the work of the ministry. Before you can do the work of the ministry, you have to first be built up in the doctrine yourself. And so we have that inward work of faith in us. And what God does inside of us is so that we can minister to others. But the work of the ministry is an outwork, is an outward work in ministering the doctrine of God outside, out of our mouths, not only out of our mouths through teaching, but also through the way we live. We are an example. Paul, Paul tells uh, uh, Titus and Timothy both to be an example. Uh, Paul, how many times did Paul say, be followers of me and mark them which walk so as you have us for an example? And so not only are we to teach this doctrine, but we are to live this doctrine out as an example to others. And this is what the Thessalonian church was. They was an example to all that believe. And so, so this work of the ministry is to do is to minister the doctrine of god by word or by example to others so that the work of godly edification can be done in them which is called the work of faith and so you have the work of the ministry and the work of faith the work of the ministry is godly edification the work of faith is godly edification and the way that godly edification happens is through the ministry of the doctrine of God to believers. And as that doctrine is believed, it is, it is producing godliness inside of those who believe it. And so the, uh, this is important, guys. And so what is the purpose of this godly edification? It is to perfect the saint for that purpose in the body of Christ. It is to get that saint ready for the life that is to come, not only the life that now is, but also the life that is to come. And so godliness is to, is to get us ready, not just for what God wants us to do now, but also what he's called us to do in the world to come. We have a high calling of, of, of God. Uh, Paul says that in Philippians. Look at Philippians chapter three real quick. Philippians chapter 3, verse number 12. Paul says, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend 
that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. And so that word apprehend means that taking possession of or to attain or to arrive at something. And so what Paul was saying here is that Christ apprehended him. And Christ apprehended him for a purpose. And now Paul is seeking to apprehend what Christ apprehended him for. And so Paul was not one of these believers that thought, well, I believe the gospel and I'm going to heaven. That's enough for me. No, Paul, Paul was following after something. He was seeking to apprehend something. And then he says in verse 13, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Oh, that high calling, guys, is, is something unbelievable that we've been called by God to obtain an inheritance to reconcile the things that he created for his son. We've been called to set in things, in positions that God created for the Lord Jesus Christ so that we can reconcile those things to God's son. And Paul is seeking to be perfected through faith. He is, he, is, he is seeking to know Jesus Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. He is seeking to apprehend and attain that perfection that is in God's son that he may receive that prize of the high calling of God. And so I want you to understand that there's more to this than just getting saved and not going to hell. There's an inheritance that we've been predestinated to, and there's a doctrine that's been given by God to be ministered to you through faith, to perfect you and to build you up and to, and to transform you from iniquity to godliness that you may be presented uh, valuable and profitable in that day that you may obtain an inheritance through that through that building up of the doctrine of god and so when you understand this doctrine now paul in second timothy um he's getting paul's getting ready to die he says at the end of this epistle he tells timothy to make full proof of his ministry to to watch in all things Make full proof of thy ministry. Do the work of an evangelist. Uh, for the for I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. Paul's Paul's done. He has fulfilled his ministry, and he's now ready to be offered. He said, "I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I kept the faith. Hence, henceforth, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous Judge." Is going to give me in that day. I believe that's the prize Paul was seeking to attain. And that crown is something that the righteous judge is going to give Paul. And he charges Timothy in 2 Timothy, uh, he charges him before the Lord Jesus Christ, who's going to judge the quick and the dead at his a kingdom, at his kingdom and his appearing, to preach the word. And to be instant in season, out of season. He tells him to make full proof of his ministry. And so what he wants Timothy to understand is, Timothy, Jesus Christ is going to come and he's going to judge one day. And I want you to make full proof of your ministry. So that when he comes and judges the quick and the dead, you may attain this crown also. And so Paul getting ready to he he's he's done in the ministry he's getting ready to die and now he's committing this ministry to timothy and not to timothy only but to all faithful men 
right? Because he tells Timothy in 2 Timothy 1, 13, to hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. And then in chapter 2, he says, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. And so he's he's leaving Timothy here with two commands to hold fast what he's heard of Paul and to take those same things that he heard of Paul and commit them to other faithful men who will be able to teach others. But what I want you to notice now is what Timothy is to hold fast is the form of sound words. He doesn't just say hold fast the sound words. He said, hold fast the form of sound words. So the, the, the words that Paul spoke, the words that Timothy heard have a form to them. And that, that is very important to get. So do you, we have to ask ourselves now, does the Bible have those words in the form that we are to hold fast. Absolutely. Romans through, we looked at this last week, but there's the form of sound words. And you cannot break this pattern, guys. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul said, I, sp I had to speak unto you as unto babes. I fed you with milk. Corinthians is milk for babies. Galatians 4.19, he says, my little children. In Ephesians, he says that you be no more children. In Philippians, he says that you may be harmless and blameless, the sons of God. In Colossians, he talks about presenting every man perfect in Christ. And then in Thessalonians, he says that those Thessalonians are an example to all that believe. And so that's the form. If you take a newborn baby, a new Christian, and try to teach him Colossians, you've broken the form. Paul didn't just say, hold fast the sound words. Everything that he wrote in Romans through Thessalonians is sound words. But he didn't just say, hold fast the sound words. He said, hold fast the form. Because this is the faith that God has given his church. And if we continue in that faith, meaning we begin in Romans and we continue in that faith from Romans through Thessalonians, we are going to be presented holy and blamable and unreprovable in God's sight. Some people, guys, some Christians never even get established in Romans. Some Christians never grow up from babies. Some are, are going to be presented as little children. And so this is the word that God gave us from Romans through Thessalonians to edify us unto our inheritance. And so wherever you're found, now remember Paul said, I have laid the foundation, that's Romans. And another buildeth thereupon. Let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. And then he says, for if any man build gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble. Now it's just interesting that after Romans, you have six churches, Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Thessalonians. That would be the Corinthian stubble. Galatian hay, Ephesians wood, Philippians precious stones, Colossians silver, Thessalonians gold. And so after this foundation in Romans, the rest of the doctrine is for the purpose of building upon that foundation. And every one of us is going to be found somewhere in this uh, uh, 
somewhere in this edification. We're either going to be found like babies, little children, whatever it may be. But just know that there is a form to the doctrine. Uh, you don't take a you don't take a uh, a five year old and start teaching him high school material. You got to first teach him the ABCs and and how to count. You got You got to teach a kid the uh, ABCs before he can read. You got to teach a child how to count before he can do math. And so these, these people who, who think that the word of God is not in the order that we are to read it and to grow up in it, line upon line, precept upon precept, they're ridiculous. They're absolutely ridiculous, brothers. I, I want you to understand that. And the reason I'm saying that, guys, is because if you hold to this and you teach this form the way it's supposed to be taught, there's a lot of people that's going to attack you for it, just like they did Paul. And so, but just know and understand if God is teaching us and edifying us for this purpose, God knows how to teach his children. And so the, the doctrine of Paul goes from foundational and then progresses from milk to strong meat and, and, and you got to learn how to minister this doctrine correctly. Uh, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And so when we say hold fast, guys, you don't just hold fast. What a lot of people do is they'll take 10 verses out of Paul's epistles. Like, by grace are you saved, ye are complete in him. And they'll take 10 verses out of Paul's epistles. They don't hold fast the form and they stifle or suppress their own growth and maturity. And, and I'm telling you guys, the doctrine, there's a form to the doctrine. And so it's not just about holding the sound words and, and 10 or 15 verses that you like. It's about holding the form, progressing, from Romans 1, 1, all the way through 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. And if you continue in that faith, grounded and settled, being rooted and built up in him, established in the faith as ye have been taught, you will be perfected, grown, increased, and matured in Jesus Christ for that day of presentation to receive, an inherit to receive the inheritance that God predestinated us to receive. And so in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Paul says in verse number nine, for we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect, notice that perfect there, when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. Now, what does he mean perfect and in part? Well, he explains it in verse 11. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. And so Paul, Paul, what Paul's talking about here is that which is perfect is as we progress from children to men. And so this edification, this growth and maturity in Christ spiritually is the same as going from a child to a man then he says for now we see through a glass darkly but then what does he mean then when he becomes a man but then face to face now i know in part but then shall i know even as also i am known and this is what paul was seeking to attain to in philippians when he says that I may know him. When he says, I've suffered the loss of all things for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. He doesn't want to know Christ vaguely or darkly through a glass. He wants to know Christ face to face. He wants to be perfected in the excellency of the knowledge of God's son. That's what Paul is striving for. Not to be some 
some puffed up man that can teach a Bible chart or, or anything else. He wants to know God's son. He wants to have the knowledge of Christ perfected in him to be completely transformed into this new man that we've been created to be in Jesus Christ. But he says in verse 13 now, and now abideth. So there's some things that's going to be done away. But Paul says there are things that abide. And what he says is what he says, says abides. When, when this perfection comes, there's three things that abide that are not done away. What are they? Faith, hope, charity. These three. And so we see there that as we go from a child to a man and from seeing darkly through a glass and as we are perfected through this doctrine that, that what, the, what we are receiving through this perfection is faith, hope, and charity. Those are the three marks of a mature man, of a man that's being perfected in Christ. The three things that denote perfection in Christ is faith, hope, and charity. And the greatest of those three is charity, right? So now if you look in Romans 1, 8, Romans begins with your faith. In Romans 1, 8, Paul says, first, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. And so right there, we see your faith. And so Romans begins with your faith. That's what you have when you begin Romans. And the purpose of Romans through Galatians, that first section runs from Romans through Galatians. And that section is designed to establish your faith in the truth of God. When, 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 you're, a, when you're a new Christian, that is when you are at your most vulnerable. That's why when, when, when you read Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, those are the biggest epistles Paul wrote. Romans has 16 chapters, 1st Corinthians has 16 chapters, 2nd Corinthians has 13 chapters, and then in Galatians you have six. But that first section running from Romans through Galatians is the biggest of Paul's epistles because that's when you're at your most vulnerable state. Your faith as a new baby in Christ or as a baby in Christ or as a little child, it is easy for your faith to be overthrown and to be rooted and grounded in errors and lies and be taken captive by Satan and ensnared by him. And so it is. this is when you are at your most vulnerable state, guys, is at the beginning. And so it is very important that we begin in Romans because the book of Romans is to get your faith established in the truth. It is the foundation of our faith. And so the first part of that Bible, the first part of that doctrine of Paul is to establish the believer on the right foundation and then to grow him and mature him from a baby up to the book of Ephesians. And so it is to when when Paul when Paul told the Corinthians there was things that he couldn't yet teach them because they were yet carnal. The first section of that Bible or of of that doctrine of Paul is not only establishing us in faith but growing us from carnal men to spiritual men so that we can understand the deeper things of God when we come to Ephesians. You're not going to skip Romans through Galatians and come right into Ephesians and think that you're going to understand it. It's just not going to happen. Uh, you have to have a spiritual mind to comprehend some things. And so there's, there's part of the epistles is written to carnal people who have carnal minds to, to renew their mind from a carnal to a spiritual mind. And so now when we come to Ephesians, 
we see that growth and maturity has taken place because Paul doesn't just talk about faith in the Ephesians. He says in Ephesians 1.15, he says, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints. Now remember back here, faith, hope, charity. And so Romans began your faith. Now it talks about your faith and love. Faith in the Lord Jesus, love unto all the saints. And so we see that by the time you get to Ephesians, from Romans through Galatians, there's been some development that took place. Your faith has been established and you have grown through that faith, through that obedience of faith, you have grown unto love unto all the saints. And now what Ephesians is going to do is continue to grow and perfect you in that love. If you look there in Ephesians chapter 3, uh, Ephesians chapter 3, I'm almost done, guys. Ephesians 3. Uh, verse number 16, Paul's prayer here is that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. And so Paul is praying that these Ephesians would have this strengthening uh, with, with might and power by the spirit of God in the inner man that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith that ye being rooted and grounded in love. So that's where that's by the time we get to Ephesians, we've been rooted and grounded in love. And now he through that rooting and grounding in love, we may be able to comprehend with all saints. What is the breadth, length, depth and height and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. And so in Ephesians, we've had our faith established. That faith is now rooted and grounded us in love. We now have this love, but Paul wants us to be perfected in that love, to come to a full comprehension of the love of Christ. And so Ephesians is about growth and perfecting the believer in love, but there's also something else. If you look back in Ephesians 1.18, his prayer also, uh, Ephesians 1.18, another prayer is the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling. And so you have faith and love, and now he wants you to know what is the hope of his calling. That's that those three again, faith, hope, charity. And so we've gone from faith in Romans to faith and love in Ephesians. Paul wants that love to be perfected, but he also wants us to come to understand and know the hope of God's calling. He's wanting to educate us in the hope of his calling. And so when you come to Thessalonians now, you have all three. And so as you go from Ephesians through Colossians, you're being perfected in love and also being being given being taught about that hope of our calling and so by the time you come to first thessalonians paul says remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope those are the three that Paul said abide in the perfect man. Faith, hope, charity. And it started with faith in Romans, godly edification in faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. It began with your faith in Romans, progressed to faith and love. And by the time you get to Thessalonians, the, you have the work of faith, the labor of love, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. That work of faith, the work of faith 
is the inward edification performed by the word of God. As the word of God was ministered, there was a work of faith done in your inner man. It built you up, establishes you, roots you, and grows you and matures you unto that, unto Christ. What it is, is it's, it's building Christ up in your inner man. That's the work of faith. And as Christ indwells your heart by faith, you begin to comprehend his love and then his love in you uh, causes you to labor in that love. So the labor of love is the outworking of Christ's love in you in the will of God. God worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. And so the purpose of the work of faith is for God to do a work in you that you might that you might be able to do his will when paul says work out your own salvation with fear and trembling for it is god that worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure that's what he's talking about god is working in you through his word to transform you and build you up to somebody that can do his will that's why paul said be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good, perfect, and acceptable will of God? And then the patience of hope is now that the work of faith has been done in you. You're now laboring in that love. The patience of hope is, is that we serve God in earnest expectation and patient waiting for his son from heaven. As Paul said in, in Philippians, our conversation is in heaven from whence also we look for the Savior. And so in Ephesians through Colossians, you're not only being perfected in love, you're also being taught this hope so that you will have the patience required to do the will of God in that labor of love because that labor of love is a selfless love. It is going to you are going to be brought into the sufferings of Christ. You are going, he is going to, through his love in you, he is going to cause you to do a will, the, the cry of Abba Father. He is going to cause you through his love to submit in, in a life of service and suffering. And you're going to need patience to do the work of God. Uh, this work of the ministry is one of the most discouraging things in the world. People are going to reward you hatred for love. They're going to do evil when you do good. You're not allowed to avenge yourself. You have to, uh, his love, his love commands us to, 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 when we're, when we're persecuted, we are to bless, uh, uh, when we, when we are defamed, we entreat it. And in order to do that, guys, the only thing that's going to give you the patience in order to endure those things is hope. Understanding that these sufferings that we now endure in the ministry is, is, is working for us. Uh, uh, as Paul said, our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory while we look not at the things that are seen. And so we have to keep our eyes on that hope of glory in order to have the patience to do these things. And so I'm going to close with this right here. And guys, we'll, we'll pick up with this, this stuff right here next week. Uh, I hope you understand the purpose of this ministry, guys to save you, to perfect you uh, unto men uh, worthy of the calling. As Paul said there in Ephesians 4, that you might walk worthy or that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you're called. And so Romans being the foundation, it is, the, it is by far the most important book that Paul wrote. 
Um, if you don't begin with the foundational establishment of the saint in the book of Romans, he's never going to be built up. The foundation has to be laid first. Everything from Corinthians to Thessalonians is built upon this foundation of Romans. And so as ministers of God, don't be scared to take your church and to really spend time in the book of Romans, establishing their faith in these, what I call the four cornerstones of the, of the book of Romans. Uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll elaborate on this next week, the book of Romans. I'm going to spend some time next week really going through this stuff, but just understand that the four cornerstones of Romans is the righteousness of God, the grace of God, the wisdom of God, and the mercies of God. Uh, the righteousness of God dealing with our justification, the grace of God dealing with, with how we are God, we are not under the law, we are under grace. Why we're under grace is two men, Adam and Christ, through Adam, sin, death, and the law through Christ, righteousness, life, and grace. And so through that grace of God, what Paul's dealing with in Thessalonians or Romans chapter five through eight is how we now serve God uh, through the life that's given to us by grace, that we are not under the law. Not only is it, are we justified by grace, we, we, we live unto God under grace. By, by the grace of God through faith, he is imparting to us the very righteousness and life of his son so that we can live unto him. And then we come into the wisdom of God in Romans 9 through 11, dealing with uh, dispensationalism and the foundation of the mystery. The mystery that Paul is going to lay out in his epistles, its foundation is in Romans 9 through 11. And then we have the mercies of God in chapter 12. That's the way we live our Christian life. We live our Christian life not as men in bondage, but as free men that love God because of his mercies. And so when Paul, by the time Paul gets to Romans 12, he asks us to do two things, present our body, and be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And that's what our, the rest of our Christian life is going to be, is we, 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 we present, we look at the mercies of God and we present our body to him and then spend the rest of our Christian life being transformed by the renewing of our mind that we may live our lives in accordance to the will of God. And that's the foundation of Romans, those four principles that God has justified us. He has given us life by his grace that we might live unto him. Then he's going to teach us that we have a mystery purpose. The reason God has done these things is because we've been chosen to fulfill a mystery that we don't learn about yet. We're going to learn about it in Ephesians. But the foundation of it is in Romans 9 that God, we've been called to fulfill a purpose of God in accordance to his own wisdom. And then by the mercies of God, we have to submit ourselves to him and be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And so we'll look at those things next week. Uh, 